Critics say a writer at the New York Daily News is blaming one of the victims of the San Bernardino attack, implying that his conservative Christian views pushed his radical Muslim co-worker to attack. Nicholas Thalassinos was a Jewish believer in Jesus Christ. He reportedly had a heated conversation about the nature of Islam with the suspected killer two weeks before the attack. Thalassinos' wife said she considers her husband a martyr for his faith and beliefs. Also killed in the attack was a Christian woman who, is, who had escaped Islamic extremism in Iran. Benetta Badal fled Iran with her family after the Islamic Revolution to escape persecution. She was 18 at the time. Here in America, she went to college, married, and had three children. In a statement, her family said, quote, It's the ultimate irony that her life would be stolen from her by what appears to be the same type of extremism that she fled so many years ago. The group American Atheists says you don't have to be Christian to celebrate Christmas, and they're using their new ad campaign right here in Colorado. Maybe you've seen these two billboards like this. It's one's along I-25 in Fountain, the other in Colorado Springs. They show Santa and the words, go ahead and skip church, just be good for goodness sake. Now, some say it's dampening their Christmas spirit, but the group says that's not the point. Um, I think it's actually really terrible, personally, and my family, we're strictly Catholic, so we've always been Catholic, always raised like that. We're trying to reach out to non-believers, specifically, and let them know that it's okay to celebrate Christmas without treating it like a religious holiday. Here's what's interesting. The billboards are only up in one other city, Raleigh, North Carolina. They're going to stay up through the new year. When you put money into the offering plate at church, the IRS wants to collect something too. For donations of at least $250, the tax agency wants to give church officials the option of handing over their donors' social security numbers. Right now, churches and charities are required to send an acknowledgement letter to their donors for their tax records. And what the IRS is saying is, well, you can skip doing that if you get the donor's social security number and then you send us a spreadsheet at the end of the year with those social security numbers. Many Americans already don't trust the IRS after the agency targeted conservative groups, and there's a fear this voluntary regulation will become mandatory. So starting today, there is a new protection at the border, biometric screenings at the part of the Otay Mesa port of entry. 10 News reporter Marie Cornell shows us how it works. And this right here is the new biometric screening kiosk, which will allow the government to keep a close eye on those who cross the border. Okay, right now. All non-U.S. citizens except children will have to go through the process. You stand there, get your picture taken, and at the same time, a scan of your iris is taken. It adds about 30 seconds to the entrance process. Those who need to have it done will only have to do it once. The goal is to know who's in the country. This will help us, for example, with visa overstays. If somebody comes in legitimately and doesn't leave, we will then know that and be able to verify did that person actually leave within the stay of their admission. The trial run lasts through June, and that's when they'll go through the data to see if this test worked. New Zealand is leading an international protest against Japan's plans to resume killing whales in the Southern Ocean. And Australia says it is considering further legal action. Prime Minister John Key said New Zealand's ambassador to Tokyo has delivered a strong formal message from, three, from 33 countries, including the United States and Australia. The Australian Foreign Minister Julia Bishop said her country would continue to raise concerns. Australia hauled Japan before the International Court of Justice in 2010 to try to end the annual whale hunt. Bishop said Australia is exploring options for further legal action. A Japanese whaling fleet set sail for the Antarctic last week. Environmentalists call it a crime against nature. Tokyo said last month it planned to kill 333 mink whales for scientific research this season. The fleet's departure marked the end of a year-long suspension prompted by United Nations International Court of Justice ruling in 2014. Recent media reports have revealed that the U.S. intelligence agency is running a secret war in Afghanistan by training secretive paramilitary units. Afghan officials have accused these forces of killing and torturing civilians. Principe's Vice Khorshi has talked to Afghan lawmakers about the revelations and the current security situation in the country. Lawmakers in Kabul have discussed continued CIA nighttime raids. The reactions were mixed. Some of the MPs described the raids as fundamental breach of the bilateral security agreement signed between Kabul and Washington. 
they believe Afghan forces are able to fight on their own now. The debate comes as the New York Times reported that CIA runs secret operations, mostly in eastern part of this country. Local militias are also involved. And based on the witness accounts, they have been implicated in torture, use of excessive force and civilian deaths. They have to like properly coordinate with the government of Afghanistan, with our security secretary, and then they can go ahead. Because sometimes rather than to target the, the terrorists, the, the insurgents, that uh, unfortunately we lost our civilian. So that's why uh, mostly had like a negative uh, consequences. U.S. house search rates have always been a bone of contention between the two countries. A new round of smog hit Beijing and its neighboring regions on Saturday night and is predicted to linger for at least four days. While the pollution affects Beijing, Tianjin and parts of Hebei province, it will reduce visibility to three to five kilometers and will cause medium to heavy air pollution over the coming days. The situation is forecast to worsen on Tuesday and Wednesday when visibility in some areas will be less than 200 meters. The smog has prompted the Beijing municipal government to issue a second orange alert, its second highest level. Now, many Beijing schools have suspended outdoor activities and construction sites will limit their activities as well. This round of smog will not be as severe as the previous wave to hit the city, but visibility will be reduced further due to the relatively high humidity. The situation will not improve until Wednesday when rain and strong gales are expected to arrive. We begin tonight with questions surrounding a murder mystery in Lexington, Kentucky. An Indianapolis man now charged with killing a six-year-old boy during a burglary. The now's Mike Pelton has been digging into this case all day and joins us live with more. Well, Candace, today I confirmed Ronald Exantis is a registered nurse here in Indiana, but police in Kentucky say he is responsible for murdering a six-year-old boy early this morning. Here is a picture of six-year-old Logan Tipton, who clearly enjoyed football. The Woodford County coroner confirms he died of multiple stab wounds to the head while he was asleep overnight. For sales, police say Ronald Exantis broke into the Tipton house early this morning, where he allegedly struggled with the father and stabbed Logan with a knife. Police arrested him for murder and burglary, and today we confirmed Exantis lives here on the north side and is a registered nurse. The Indiana Professional Licensing Agency tells me Exantis was issued a license in 2013 and renewed this past August. He has no complaints against him. Meanwhile, police and Versailles are still piecing this murder together as the Tipton family grieves the death of young Logan. Police in central Indiana tonight say he may not be the Grinch who stole Christmas here, but... He's pretty close. Yeah, they're now searching for this man caught on tape stealing one family's Christmas gifts, but it gets worse. RTV6's Jason Fechner joins us live with the story all new at 6. Jason. Well, it seems to be happening more and more packages stolen right off someone's front porch. But the people stealing those packages more and more seem to be getting caught on tape. A lot of homeowners continue to add small cameras and small security systems. But what one camera just caught caught even police by surprise. Kind of sad. Before some packages went missing from Marilyn Hickrod's porch on Friday, one package was successfully delivered just two weeks ago. A security camera. And it worked like a dream. Marilyn was notified that her grandkids' Christmas gifts had been delivered, but nowhere to be seen. She checked the video. The next spot that showed up on the camera was a man walking up to the door, stopping, hesitating, looking at the box, and then walked away with the box that was left at the door by the mail lady. And maybe the worst part of this story is that that criminal walked right past a nativity scene before stealing those gifts. Our manger scene, uh, Mary, Joseph, and the baby, and he didn't even hesitate. Not a bit. Hickrod shared the video and pictures with police who posted it online, now asking for any tips to lead to the Grinch, who really did steal Christmas. But this uh, technology that's out nowadays allows us to put these kinds of things out there, so I am uh, hopeful and expectant that we will get a call on this. We've had some good success with our Facebook pages helping us solve these crimes in the past, and I uh, don't expect this one to be any different. If he'd have come the day before, he would have gotten toilet paper and paper towels, and if he was desperate enough that he needed that, I would say, uh, just knock on my door, I'll be happy to give you a roll of paper towels and a roll of toilet paper if you needed it that bad. The show goes on at 2 a.m. Havana's Drag Queen Cabaret, lip syncing six nights a week as cocktails flow and crowds grow. Cuba's underground gay scene slowly becoming mainstream. This new club, the latest to openly cater to LGBT customers. 
Now there's a boom. All the bars want to have drag queens, says Kitty Am, who began performing in secret 21 years ago. She takes us to a tiny dressing room packed with female impersonators. Some do drag full time. Ten years ago, she says, we might have been scared to perform or even to meet in certain places. A decade ago, Cubans could still go to prison for public displays of homosexuality. In the 1960s and 70s, the Castro regime persecuted sexual minorities, sending some people to labor camps. Today, President Raul Castro's daughter, Mariela Castro, runs the National Center for Sex Education, Cuba's only state agency advocating for LGBT rights. Kitty Am says she's a health promoter, conveying the state-controlled safe sex message during her shows. But critics say the Cuban government overlooks a huge problem in the LGBT community. Sex workers catering to foreigners can earn more in a single night than a Cuban doctor makes in a month. Several men we spoke to say gay for pay is one of many issues ignored by Cuba's mainstream LGBT activists. Raiko Pin Nunez says it's still complicated to be openly gay on the communist-run island. For example, he says, if I walked down the street right now holding my partner's hand, it would not be taken well. People would stare, make comments. He says his family accepts him, but all of his ex-boyfriends have left Cuba. He says those who stay are still forced to lead una doble vida, a double life. My dream is to get married, to have kids, he says, to have the same rights as someone who's straight. But here, it's complicated. He dreams of equality and the end of homophobia that still permeates Cuban society, a dream even the most optimistic LGBT advocates say is likely decades away.